basically I'm asking you this question because I'm kind of setting you up. Um, we've, we've come to an in-depth portion of scripture uh, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has a lot of, of those portions that, you know, because of so many cultural things that are taking place uh, that they're referencing that we're kind of, you know, we don't, we don't understand them. And you have to stop and you have to explain them. We've come to a portion of scripture this morning that it's probably one of the more difficult portions of Scripture that we have, in, particularly in all of the New Testament. We're in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, if you're not there already. But in verse 26, it says this. I'll just give you the first verse before we read the whole text in a moment. It says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Now, what is that saying? What does that mean? Isn't that contradictory to so many of the other things that we have, you know, in, in, in God's Word? Well, we're going to look at that this morning. And, and I want to start by just reminding us um, what the main point of the book of Hebrews is. Because if you don't understand that, if you don't remember that, this is going to get confusing for you. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers. Many of these Jewish believers, they come to Christ and ask Him for the forgiveness of their sins. They become Christians. But after time, they began kind of settling back into their old ways. In, in their, you know, into Judaism. Into the practice of the obedience of the law and, and the traditions that they had under Judaism. Also at the same time, the winds of persecution were in the air. And many were pulling back from their faith. Because of the threat of persecution. The book of Hebrews then is written to them. It is God's proclamation of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. You know, God helps us in the book of Hebrews to connect the dots between all those things that they were practicing in the Old Testament. The law, the priesthood, the tabernacle, all of the sacrifices. And he explains how these are all symbols pointing to their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so the book of Hebrews at the very heart is at the, about the supremacy of Jesus Christ compared to anything else that we could fall back to. Now if you remember a few months ago, we were, as we've been working through the book of Hebrews, we're in Hebrews chapter 6, and we hit another very difficult portion of scripture, very similar to what we're going to find here in, in chapter 10. In chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it said this, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then, having fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again, they crucified to themselves the Son of God and they put him to open shame. You see, chapter 6 is a similar warning to what we're going to have here in chapter 10, those warnings, if we remember, are given to Christians telling us of the loss that we will suffer if we don't go forward in our faith. But if we fall back, if we become, you know, stranded in our faith and we don't grow. So many of the visuals and the symbols that you have in the book of Hebrews, it talks about, you know, at time when we should be, you know, using the meat of the word, we're still in need of milk. At times when we should be teachers of the word, we're, we're still babes in Jesus Christ. It's a challenge to constantly grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a warning of what happens when we don't grow. What happens when I just put my faith on the shelf? What happens when I just kind of, you know, I pick it up whenever I want and, you know, put it down whenever I want? You know, that doesn't matter. But these are God's answers to that. That it does matter what we do. It does matter if we grow. Think of these two warnings that you have in chapter 6 and what we're going to look at today in chapter 10. They're kind of like bookends. And in between them, you know, these bookends, these warnings against, you know, not growing in our faith. In between these bookends, God states his case for Jesus Christ's supremacy. You know, as a, you know he's the real thing. Over falling back to anything, whatever symbols, whatever, you know, religion, whatever the world can offer. You know, it, it's not worth falling back. Now, I understand that there's a lot of confusion that surrounds this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning. Um, the confusion is mostly over whether it's speak, you know, speaking about believers and non-believers. 
You know, who's it talking about here? So what I want to do this morning is I first want us to come to an understanding of what I believe God is, is saying here. Understanding the context of the whole book. And then let's talk about the application. Why is he saying it? You know, usually we get to these difficult passages. We spend so much time wrestling with them, understanding them, that we forget the truth for a reason. God is telling us this for a purpose. There's something for us to go away and do as a result of this. And so let's first explain it, and then we'll talk about what God is calling us to do. I'm going to have you stand as God's word is read. We're going to read uh, chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. And follow along with me if you would. It says, For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot of the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You may be seated. Now, so it's important for us to, to answer that question about the readers or who it's talking about. Here, it's talking about those who are saved or those who aren't yet saved, aren't Christians. Well, if they're saved, then is this saying that a Christian can willfully continue, continually sin? And eventually God says, you know, that's enough, I've had it. You are no longer one of the children of mine. Yes, I saved you. Yes, at one point you were one of my children, but you, 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 you've just piled up sin. You pile up unforgiveness. You, you, you pile up immorality. You know, the decisions that you make, forget it. You are no longer a child of mine. If it says, if we say they weren't Christians, then we have other problems. Then we have a problem with the language. Because it certainly uses terms that are associated with salvation. Now, as I was studying this, you know, those who, who believe it's talking about unsaved, they, they don't have a problem with the language. And then there's ways that they explain it. And let me give you both sides of it here real quick here. You know, in verse 26, I mean, it starts, if we go on sinning. So the author uses the word we. You know, he's including himself in, in this group. Um, some authors say, oh, but he's just speaking rhetorically. He's not really meaning himself, you know, being a Christian. He's just meaning, you know, people. Well, if you go back one verse to verse 25, you know, kind of leading into this, it says, it talks about not forsaking our own assembly together as in the half the sum, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day dawning. For if we go on sinning, I mean, it's all a continual thing. I mean, we have the breaks and the chapters and the verses. We put those in there. But it's all a continual thought. So one moment he's talking about our gathering together, you know, and you know, waiting, you know, for the, the Lord's return. All the more as we see him, you know, coming closer. And then he talks about what happens if we go on sinning. So it seems to include himself in, in, in this category. And verse 29 talks about by which he was sanctified. You know, that's a that's a that's a biblical term. And some authors say, well, that's speaking about Jesus being sanctified. It's not talking about the readers being sanctified. But really, if you read it in its context, it's talking about the readers. Matter of fact, in the Greek here, it's, it's written in a non-conclusive manner. In other words, it could go either way, whether it's talking about Jesus or whether it's talking about the reader. And whenever something is written in a non-conclusive manner, you put it back in its context and that gives you the indication of which way that it's talking about here. And, you know, you, you, you put it in the flow of it, it, it's talking about believers here. Verse 30 says the Lord will judge his people. You know, he's not talking about them, he's talking about his people. You know, verse 32, it, we didn't read in there, but it says, remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. Man, that, he's talking about believers here. So it's pretty obvious that this is talking to believers. Um, but we're going to see that this isn't a contradiction of the rest of Scripture. This isn't teaching that you can be saved and one day, you know, if you do so many things wrong, that ultimately God is going to cast you away and you can no longer be saved. And that's not what it's talking about at all here. Matter of fact, if you remember back, and we said these bookends in chapter 6 and chapter 10, 
again, it's confusing here, but in these bookends, they kind of build off of each other. I mean, way back in chapter 6, verse 6, where it says, it talks about, it says, those who have fallen away, it says, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and they put him to open shame. Remember, we talked about the issue there, talked about repentance, the ability to have repentance. And, and the key there is, which repentance is this talking about? There are two types of repentance. There's a repentance to become a child of God, that one-time decision I make to give my life to the Lord, to repent of my sins, to confess myself a sinner in need of a Savior. But even after we get saved, we still need to repent of our sins. You know, still when I do something wrong, it doesn't just go away. I, I need to confess it to the Lord. I need to ask the Lord's forgiveness. And we saw as we looked at chapter 6 that it's talking about the, the second type of repentance. It's talking about what happens when a believer continually sins and continually sins and continually sins. The first, the first preceding that, you know, talks about moving forward in our faith, you know, from, from milk to the, the meat of the word. What happens when we, we're just stalled out in our faith? What happens when we're living, you know, in the world? Well, then it says, and after verse 6 there, it says in verse 7, for ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to those whose sake it is also tilled, they receive a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles and is worthless and close to being cursed, it ends up being burned. So it talks about, you know, that believer there that is, is soaking up those things of God. But what kind of fruit is he producing? Some producing nothing but thistles. You know, we hear God's word. You know, we sing God's songs, we hear those messages, we have our devotions, we read our Bibles. We are so saturated with the Word of God. But what in the world is happening with our life? Is it any different? Am I any different in my faith than I was a year ago? Five years ago? You know, that's what it's talking about there. And for the believer who ultimately soaks up the things that God gives but not, does not produce fruit... It says, ultimately, there comes to a place where God puts them on a shelf. You know, we talked about, remember in Timothy, about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. You know, some vessels, you know, we keep in our house, we keep out because we like people to see them. But there's certain vessels that we don't keep out, you know, our pots and pans and, you know, our, you know the toilet plunger and those sorts of things. We don't, we don't put them out in the living room for everybody to see. You know, they're vessels of dishonor. They're still our vessels. But they're just not vessels that we put forth. And that is what this has been talking about. It's similar to the warning we got in 1 Corinthians 3. We'll put this up here for you. Remember where it says each man, so I'm about believers here. It says each man will work will become evident. For the day will show it. Because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through the fire. And that's, again, this is a, a, a theme that runs throughout all of Scripture. The point is that we will suffer loss as a Christian if we continually live in a way that puts Christ open shame. We become those vessels of dishonor. So that's one side of the book. And that's what it was talking about in verse 6 here, or chapter 6. Now I want to look at what it says about in chapter 10 here. All right? Again, it's a similar thing that they're building on. For if we go on sinning, verse 26, willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now again, the surface reading of this may lead you to think, that if we continually sin after getting saved, that eventually God says no more. He's not going to forgive your sins anymore, and you're going to end up in eternal punishment. Folks, that's why it's important that we wrestle through these difficult portions of Scripture to find out what the truth, what it's really saying. Because if you don't, you're going to open yourself up to live in error. So it makes a statement there about there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, folks, this can't be talking about salvation. If this is talking about a, 
salvation here, that there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, then that would mean that the cross of Christ was insufficient. That the cross doesn't cover all the sins. That what he said back in chapter 9, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, about Christ. Remember it said, for Christ did not enter the holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with blood that is not their own. Otherwise, he would have had needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he, Jesus, has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. To say there ever comes a time that there is no sacrifice for sin is in, in, in regards to salvation, that there is a sin that you can commit that ultimately would cause you to lose your salvation, is to say that the cross of Jesus Christ was incomplete. I believe what it is saying here, and it is probably once again most likely an Old Testament reference. If you remember back in the Old Testament law, they were commanded to offer sacrifices for various sins. And if they committed a sin, you know, they, they, they had this sacrifice that would be ordained, and they'd offer that sacrifice. But it tells us in Numbers, chapter 15, verse 30, it talks about willful defiant sin, and it says this, But the person who does anything defiantly, whether he is a native or an alien, that one is blaspheming the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. You see, this was an issue of fellowship, this defiant sin. You know, this attitude as, well, I'm a Christian, I can just do as I please. And that attitude would harm the body of Christ. So God has no sacrifice that would allow them to just live as they want, and I'll just go <laughs> offer a sacrifice. I'll just do what I want, I'm going to defy the Lord, and, you know, no big deal, you know, I'll go out on Friday, defy the Lord, Saturday morning I'll go offer a sacrifice. He didn't want a life to be lived like that. He didn't want a life of broken fellowship. So that's what it's, it's probably referencing here. Verse 27, let's go on here. Verse 27, it says, but it talks about a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversary. Now you gotta stop, you gotta ask yourself, who is actually being judged here? It's talking about a, a fire that will consume the adversary. So is it talking about a, a judgment that is going to consume the person who sinned? Or consume the adversary? The adversaries are the forces that set themselves up against God's kingdom. That's what's going to be judged here. It says in Philippians chapter 3, it says, For many walk of whom I often have told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. They are the ones that are going to be destroyed. That whole verse has the idea of a Christian giving themselves to sin. You know, we, we give ourselves to sin, we give ourselves to the world that one day is going to be destroyed. And then you're going to stand empty before God. And what do you have you given your life to? What, what cause you know, of the world have you given yourself to that ultimately is not going to stand in the end? That's what's going to be judged. The adversary, the sin is going to be destroyed. When it's destroyed, are you going to have anything left that you have been living your life for? Verse 28 and 29. It says, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot of the Son of God and is regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Again, what, what this is saying here, you know, the idea is that if God considered the sins of the Old Testament, you know, of his called out people, if he considered them serious enough, how much more after the cross after Christ has died for our sins, does he consider our sins any less serious? Probably even more serious because of grace and mercy. Probably because we have the Holy Spirit living within us when we become a child of his. I mean, he's drawing a comparison here. 
He says, don't think just because of grace that somehow, you know, sin isn't as important to God. It really doesn't matter to God because, you know, the cross, it does matter how we live. It does matter what we do in our life. In part, this is an answer to those who think that salvation by God's grace gives us a, a freedom to sin before God. And he'll just simply forgive it. You know, that's what Paul's argument was in, in the book of Romans. We've been looking at that in our ABF class, Romans chapter 6. You know, it says, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so grace may abound? You know, if, if you know, the idea here, if grace is such a good thing and the more I sin, the more God gives grace, then I'm really kind of helping God do his thing and, you know, I'm doing my thing. And, you know, that, that's kind of a worldly argument that was given here. But he says, may it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? As a matter of fact, by the time we get to chapter 12 of Hebrews, we're going to see, I mean, th this is all building about believers and what happens when, when we, we don't grow. What happens when we continue to live by the world. And you come down to chapter 12 and it's going to say in verse 5 and 6, Have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, that my son do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him? For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he receives. God doesn't want us to stay at the place. God allows things into our life. He brings things into our life to get our attention, to cause us to look up to Him, to cause us to seek Him again, to cause us to grow in our faith when we become waylaid in our faith. Now verse 30 and 31. He says, For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge His people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Now I want you to pay close attention here. Because one of the greatest casualties of contemporary Christian movement is the loss of the holiness of God. There are many good things that have come out of the contemporary Christian movement. But one of the great tragedies is that in trying to portray God as a more acceptable form to the world, many have ignored the fact that God hates sin. That judgment for sin is a surety. And that it is a terrible thing to fall outside of God's pleasure and God's will. That as Christians, we are here to serve God. And regardless of our, you know, reversing that equation that, you know, we're here to serve God, that, you know, of making that, well, God's here to serve me. Regardless of us reversing that equation, we are all going to answer for our lives before God by the rules that He has set, by the standards that He has set. And Hebrews 6 and now Hebrews 10 is God's definitive word to believers that it does matter how you live once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It matters the decisions you make. It matters what the priorities of your life are. It makes a difference whether we strive forward to maturity or whether we wallow in infancy. Whether we commit willful sin or whether we you know, have that, that the desire to be pleasing unto God. So that's what... That's how this fits together. You know, what we've been doing since chapter 6 all the way to, to chapter 10 here. So, so hopefully we can understand. I know it's confusing. But now the question is, so what? I understand this. I understand what God is saying here. But let's look at the application here. You know, this all ties into the whole theme of the book. We have said over and over again that God is addressing our tendencies as Christians. And I know you can all attest to this. about You get saved and you're all excited in your faith. You're all excited to serve the Lord. And, and you can go, you know, weeks and months and, and maybe years. And slowly Satan is just pounding away. You know, he never gives up. We live in this world and we have our own sinful nature that we're battling with. And it, it just so weighs on us. And it's so easy for us to stop. To stop growing. 
to stop the zeal and stop the passion that we once had and just rest at the place we're at and say, you know, I'm comfortable here. The question is, is God comfortable with you there? Is this what Christ died for, what your life is that you're living right now? Is that why he went to the cross? Is that why he redeemed you and called you to himself for the life that you are now living? You see, for the Jews... They had a tendency to fall back in their old practices. For us, you know, a lot of times it's pulling back to our old lifestyles. You know, not growing in our faith. Not growing in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What well, we've been given here, you know, from chapter 6 to chapter 10, uh, we've been given a lot of encouragement to not pull back in our faith, but to go forward. I want to summarize these. I want to give you three encouragements to no matter where you are in your faith to, to begin engaging again, to begin growing. Encouragement number one, and we've been looking at this one, so we're just going to briefly touch on this. Your first encouragement is the fear of God. The fear of God should move us to strive forward in our faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. It says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You know, one day we are all going to stand before Jesus Christ, and we're going to answer. We're going to answer for yesterday, we're going to answer for today. We're going to answer for things that we have forgotten. And God is going to recompense us. And this isn't just a negative thing we're going to answer for. it. I don't answer for all those, those great decisions that I made, that you made, those decisions for Christ, those decisions to serve, those decisions to forgive, the decisions for grace and mercy. God, God is going to bring those things all together. And he said they're going to matter. And they just don't fall by the wayside. So the real question is, now, do you fear God? I mean, do you look at this time that's standing for God? And when I talk about this fear of God, I'm not talking about the running from God and hiding, I'm afraid. But is, is God still holy to you? And just? And is God all powerful to you? That the idea of standing before Him and answering for my life is going to cause me to strive? That I want to be pleasing to Him? That He is my master? That I don't make those decisions for Him? That I'm not going to trample His grace and His mercy? But in love I'm going to choose Him and serve Him and sacrifice for Him? I mean, that, that idea that one day I'm going to have to answer for, for all of that. I'm going to have to account for my life. See, that's supposed to encourage us to strive to move forward. Because it's not a negative thing here. One day I'm going to answer for a choice that I made to, to go and serve my neighbor. Or to stop and encourage somebody in Christ. Or to tell somebody else about Christ. I, I'm going to be rewarded for that. That's all going to be there before Christ. Do you believe God enough? Do you believe in God enough to understand what it would be like to stand before Him and not want to be empty-handed? But at that moment, to want my hands to be so full to be able to lay these gifts down before Christ, the fear of God should move us to strive forward in our faith. Number two, your former experiences in Christ should encourage you to finish the course. This is probably an encouragement probably for those of you who have been saved for some time. And, 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 and maybe you've plateaued. Maybe you've even fallen back. It says in verse 32, it says, But remember the former days, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. I mean, here's the idea here. Have you, have you given so much to Christ to simply walk away from it because of a difficulty you're going through right now? Or, or some trial that you're going through? I mean, you know, remember those days when you served him faithfully. Look at your life now. Are you serving him now? Are you making decisions based on Christ right now? 
Are you willing to throw away all those days that you faithfully served him? Just because of, of the difficulty you're going through right now? I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26, he says this. He says, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and I make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul didn't want to get to the end of his life and not finish well. He wanted to finish strong. He wanted to finish for the Lord Jesus Christ. To receive those that well done, that good and faithful servant. It says in verse 37 here, and we're going to stay in uh, the Hebrews 10 here. It says in verse 37, For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Mark those words. It talks there about persevering, about not shrinking back, not pulling back, but, but striving forward. Folks, I don't know what it is exactly you might be going through in your life right now. And it may seem like a hard road to hoe. But folks, compared to eternity, whatever you are called to persevere through today is nothing more than a vapor. Put, about, put it in eternal perspective. This life is so short compared to eternity. I love that description that I've used it before of, of eternity and how long eternity is. It says if you could take a dove, and that dove could fly all the way to the moon and fly around the moon and, and back to earth, and then fly around earth, and he's past earth, he, he brushed earth with his wing and, and stirred up a little bit of dust. How long would it take for that dove to keep making those passes and just make one swipe at the earth for finally the earth to fade away? That's just the beginning of eternity. I mean, what is it that we're going through right now that would cause us to shrink or to pull back in the face of one day that reward that we'll receive for Christ? Forever and ever and ever to be living in. With eternity in full view, will you stay faithful? We stay focused, not get distracted with the world, not get discouraged with what's going on around you. 2 Corinthians 4 says momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but we look at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen right here now, they're temporal. But the things which are not seen, they are eternal. Let me give you one last encouragement, a third encouragement. And that is the surety of a reward. The surety of a reward. Verse 34 in Hebrews 10. It says, For you showed sympathy to the prisoner, and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a greater reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't take a sabbatical. You never retire from your faith. You never retire from growing, from striving to the very, very end. For a Christian, there is a reward. For how we live our faith. That reward spoken of here. It's not a reward meaning. Well you're going to be saved. Because that would be earning our salvation. No it's a reward. That is depending upon. How we lived our Christian life. It makes a difference. It matters. As a matter of fact I referred to those verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. About that foundation we've been given. Of Jesus Christ and how we build upon it. It says there. And these are the last verses I'll leave with. It says, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it will be revealed. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. 
whatever I'm building on my faith in Jesus Christ, whatever materials, the quality of which I am living my Christian faith, it will be rewarded. And it goes on, if any man's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through the fire. So let me ask you, are you striving to be rewarded in your faith? Do you even have that, you know, in your mindset? Well, I'm a Christian. You know, I believe in Christ. I believe he died for me. You know, he's, you know, I love the Bible. I love reading. I love coming and worshiping and, you know, studying God's word. But do you leave away from here with a goal of striving to live your faith so faithful that in the end you'll be rewarded? That God can use you and pour you out. I'm not talking about it. doesn't have to be even great things, but faithful things. Quality type of things. <coughs> To live a life worthy of the foundation of Jesus Christ. Let me put it another way, and we'll end with this and look at that from the other point of view here. Whenever you have given yourself to the world, what lasting value has it ever given back to you? When you have given yourself to the things of the world, that, that, that momentary pleasure that it gives you, what long lasting thing has the world ever given back to you? See, it's time to renew our faith. Hebrews is a call for Christians to live our lives, to rise up, to focus on the purpose for which Christ has saved us. To live faithful to Him, to live striving in our faith. Not just be putting in time until eternity but to using our time wisely that one day we'll stand before Christ and we'll receive a reward for how we live our faith. Let's pray. Father, I come before you. And Father, I first come to you in confession. There's sometimes these things I, I read, I study in your so far beyond me. Even the idea of living faithful to you, of striving. Look at my life and I see so many failures before you, but I am so thankful that each day is a new day, each moment is a new moment. Each decision is a, is a, a choice to, to choose my master and whom I will serve. And I thank you for your grace, and your mercy, and your forgiveness. Lord, I just pray for every believer in Christ that is here today. Help us to look at our week differently. Help us to see our job differently. It's an opportunity, Lord, to serve you. Our ministry is here at the church. Not as, you know, just another in a week. But Father, give us that zeal, that passion, renew within us those opportunities that are there for us. Those seeming less monotonous times just out in the community where, God, if we are seeking you, you will give us an opportunity to testify of your name, to tell somebody else about Christ, to lay up those treasures in heaven. And I really ask you to, to just give us your eyes in the life you've given us. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit gives us the power, is the power and the strength. And it's not my own effort to just try as hard as I want, but Father, it's all about submitting to you. It's all about desiring and wanting and more of Christ, less of me. Thank you, Father, for being here on this journey with us. Pray these things in my son's name. Stand together with me.